let's get going. Now, for Python, uh, let's say you're writing a simple script and you have this main and just to, we'll just do a simple, uh, start with a simple hello world script. And if you're doing this in, in you know, real Python sort of, sort of fashion, you'll see this if name equals main bit at the, at the bottom of the scripts. Totally optional, but we can go into uh, run Python, I call this fun. And we have hello world. Yeah, I'll make this a little bigger here. Basic hello world. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the syntax, it, this, uh, this just means that main will only run if we're running it directly with Python. It won't run if you're importing this file from somewhere else. That's all that is. But you'll see this uh, a couple other places in this talk tonight. Now, if, if we want to create a, let's say, a say hello function, we give it a name. And we'll have this print something else. Let's just say, uh, hello name. We love our F strings here. And we'll just call this from our main function to start building this out just a little bit. We run this again, hello, Michael. Very simple, we, we just have a function. We're passing this string value of Michael into it and it's printing off a function. <clears throat> to, to change this up just a little bit uh, for what we're about to do, I'm just going to change this so that we instead print the return value up here. So now this function is just returning a string. If we run this again, same output. Here's, uh, here's where the cool thing comes up. Actually, PyLance is already is already spoiling this a little bit. Uh, this is VS Code, and there part of uh, one of the optional things you can do is there's a code uh, checker called PyLance. It does a lot of stuff for you, but you can also already see that in my tooltip here, it's already it already knows that it's inferring that we're returning a string, and this is the first. Uh, this is one of the ways that we can use type annotations in Python. In other languages, uh, in strongly typed languages, you would need to specify a type for our function parameters, which here, oh, it's stopping. Here, there we go. We would have to specify something like this, where we expect that name is a string and we are also going to return a string in this call. We run this again, no change. You'll notice, however, that by default, Python, we can, uh, we can give this a one, we can save this and it still works. We're saying that we are expecting this to be a string but it doesn't matter because we're, uh, in this case, we're doing string interpolation. This is magically safe through, through the power of uh, Python logic that's underneath. But these type annotations are not at all enforced by default. You actually have to have, uh, you have to have third party libraries to enforce any kind of typing in Python. Uh, and so there's no type checking at runtime without a lot of overhead. That may change in the future, but not until Python 4, 5, some, some, sometime way in the future. But it, uh, for basic readability, you can look at this and know more or less exactly what, what it's expecting. Uh, we have a string. If, I go, uh, if we go back to the tooltips on here, you can see that our tooltip is updated with the input types of a string, and we also return a string. We can, uh, we can, you can do this with any number of things. Let's just say, uh, uh, let's say repeat is a Boolean. 
So I actually think, let's see. I'm, I'm trying to remember if I can do, uh, let's say, if repeat, let's see, name plus equals a space and just say name again. So this would say, hello, Michael, Michael. Now down here, we change this back and we need to give this a, a true if we want to double it up. So hello, Michael, Michael down here. But we can also say, uh, normally if you were not using Python annotations, you would have repeat equals false here to specify a default value in this function. It's the same thing. We just put it after the type. So we can go back here, get rid of that. It, uh, the default value is false, add it to true, and we're back. Now, uh, if we wanna do something a little more complex, for example, what if we want this to be, uh, let's instead of repeat, let's say repeat number, of actually without even updating it, we make without making it verbose. If if I change this to an int, let's say that this repeat means how many number of times I want it to repeat. Uh, if if it was just this and there was no there was no doc string here telling you what repeat did. You, do, you wouldn't know what is expecting. This is one of the big advantages that Python typing gives you, these Python annotations, is that it makes the intent of how you use a function and a class uh, much clearer in your documentation. So let's say this repeat is an int, and what happens if we initialize it to none? Well, none is not an integer. But clearly, there's a default value of none. So the developer intends, hey, this can be none. In order to handle this, uh, in other languages like Swift, they have it built into where you could just add a question mark afterwards for an optional value. In Python, as of 3.6, Python introduced the typing module. So we can do from typing import optional form from typing import optional. So this is actually an optional type of an int. And we can do if repeat is not none. Uh, let's just say for blank in range repeat. This technically will this should work. And down here, let's say I give this three. <laughs> well, I did this. Good. Um, the reason why this happened is because I keep doing plus equals on name. I'm not actually, yeah. That's not. Figuring that out is not the point of this talk. I'll keep going. <laughs> Which also means we can omit this and, na and name is still there, whatever. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the neat advantages that came after they introduced this typing module, they introduced something that was heavily inspired by the adders library called a data class. So we can do from data classes import data class. And if you've ever done something like, let's say data equals, uh, let's say count one and uh, favorite true. If, if, let's just say you have a bunch of these inside of your code, maybe, Maybe you just have a list of a whole bunch of these in your code. Data classes were introduced 
so that you could actually create this uh, this managed struct. Other uh, I would the closest thing I would equate to it in other languages like C would be a struct. So we just create a class. Uh, let's just call it. Would this be like an interface in like Java or TypeScript or something? Yeah, uh, it's it. The JavaScript comparison is interesting because just because of nomenclature, I think uh, objects in in JavaScript and TypeScript are the equivalent of dictionaries in Python, but they also are they also have far more functionality. Uh, like classes in TypeScript are technically just objects that you can put methods on as well uh, and access the same way. So I actually, yeah, I think the JavaScript or, or specifically the TypeScript comparison is quite apt for a data class. And we'll see why in just a sec. <clears throat> um, uh, I'll, just, I'll just call this count. So we have a count class, and it can have a couple of values associated with it, just based on this up here. And we can even give this a default value, by the way. So we're now going from the realm of function annotations to variable annotations. And this, this syntax was introduced in 3.7, the same time that the data class was introduced. And this is one of the best uses still for it, for something other than just readability. To turn this class into a data class, uh, well, normally, if you, want, if you wanted to use this, you might have to come up with an init that takes a count and a favorite and, and all that stuff. But we don't actually have to do that. All we do is put a data class on there. And we're going to ignore the say hello for a second. I'll make this a little bit smaller as well. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to create a new count, and you'll notice that in our tooltip up here, this initializer has already been written for us based on the structure of this data class, which I think is pretty neat. So we can give this a count of five. And because the, this favorite has a default value, we can just end it there. We can then print our count here. And if we run our function down below, you'll see that we, actually, we have a count object with count equals five and favorite set to false. We can access this information just like uh, any, other, uh, any other class object in here. So if we want, it, uh, is it a favorite? It's just dot favorite. This looks much similar to uh, JavaScript style syntax now, as opposed to Python. If we wanted, uh, if we were still using data up here, uh, we would have to do something like this for our uh, dictionary syntax, but we don't have to with data classes. The other thing that makes a data class really interesting from uh, for the, the TypeScript comparison is we because this is a class, we can write other methods on this. Uh, so does it also do like typical uh, class inheritance type stuff? So in essence, you have more like a type class than an yeah, interface? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm just going to make an increment uh, class on here. Oh, and by the way, uh, for for full typing, uh, which we'll get to in a second with MyPy, if your function returns nothing, you you actually do return none uh, in here. But I'll just do. Oh, I need self in here. Uh, self dot count plus equals one to increment. So we can print our count, and then I can call. Uh, count dot increment and print our count again. Oh, oh, uh, that's right. It opened up a new window. If we run this again. 
we initialize with count equals five, we increment count equals six. So you can have all of these helper methods on there. You absolutely can do uh, class inheritance. So we still need to do a data class on here, but then we can do, uh, let's say, uh, advanced count. And we can inherit from count. And maybe this just has another method on there, but uh, there is a caveat to data class inheritance that I want to quickly show here. We've covered data classes in the past, but this is uh, it, this is a good question. Uh, let's say we want to add, a, uh, just call it a store. Uh, and by the way, this is Python 3.9. So I can actually just say that this is, uh, let's say we take a list of integers in, in this store. Yeah, so here's, here's the error that is gonna show here. Data class fields without a default value cannot appear after data fields with the default values. The reason for this error is because if you remember from our initializer down here in count, it's, uh, these are in the same order as we listed them in our class here. This means that it goes count, favorite, store, when we want to initialize this, any, this advanced count object. However, if you know from Python, you are not allowed to have positional arguments placed after uh, arguments with default types. That is true here for advanced count. So the, the way to fix this is we either need to remove the default type from favorites, and you'll see that our error goes away, or we need to give a default value to store. And I, the way to do that, and I'm still, I, I still need to look this up, but I believe, yeah, uh, you do this by creating a field a def I think it's uh, just default equals whatever you want it to be, and that will take care of that error as well. Uh, but that that is a gotcha when you want to do inheritance. Uh, another big thing that I do with with data classes in particular is uh, you, I will have in uh, helper class methods, so you can do a count from some object and then it just creates a new count for you using whatever initialization logic you want. Uh, okay. So, uh, oh, and the, the last little thing about these annotations, other than being really helpful for readability, uh, if you want to use annotations like the, li the three libraries I'm about to show do, there are two ways that you can, oh, uh, oh, uh, one other thing for this this list, this uh, lowercase list. Uh, if you're if you're familiar with Python, you know list one two three is one of the ways you can initialize a list. Uh, this syntax here, list using list as a type with this int, uh, this uh, you know, it is a list of integers. This is new as of three point nine. If you are using uh, three point eight, three point seven, or point six you actually will have to do from typing import capital L list uh, because it was not supported then. Uh, you also have other things up here like unions. Technically in uh, this optional class is actually just shorthand for a, a union of none and some other type. Uh, so it, let's say if, if this say hello, uh, we can either have this be say, an optional, you know, an optional string, or uh, at which is analogous to none or a string. And there's a bunch of these other things. Uh, if you if you don't care what the if you explicitly do not care what the return type is, uh, there typing also has any or anything else. Uh, we can even say that uh, say hello can return our advanced count as the return type. Uh, any valid type in Python, you can use in type annotations. Uh, and while your type checkers will not like it, uh, there are some libraries I've seen that actually will take 
strings as descriptors and be able to use those. Again, typing does not matter in vanilla Python. It is there for readability and other libraries that you want to work with. Uh, yes, and the last little thing. So we have uh, the way to access these annotations if you want to write a program that actually uses them is to do say hello dot annotations. If we print this out, this should give us a dictionary that gives us all of our parameters and, and types. Oh, I need to get rid of this. Default factory. Yep, I knew I didn't quite remember that. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this for the time being so we can move on. Yeah, OK, so here we go. For our say hello function definitions, our annotations, our name parameter is type string. Our repeat parameter is an optional integer. And our return type is also of type string. So we're going to see a couple of libraries that use this information to help us power up our Python. Do, uh, do I have any more questions before I move on? I just want to clarify. So when you're getting those type output messages, those are coming from the main compiler. They're not running from a, is that coming from the annotation you're importing from the library? So that like that right above the bottom there, it looks like, okay, it looks like you just ran the compiler and oh. name class string repeat typing dot optional. Yeah, so. Oh, so because you printed out the annotations. Yep, yeah, that's all I this see. is coming from. This is just a dictionary. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. So, if we wanted to just, if we only wanted to know the return type of, of this, if I run this again, we'll just see the return type is class string. Uh, there's another way to access this information. Uh, we can do get type hints. Uh, likely, the, the libraries I'm about to show you are not actually using dot annotations. They're more. They're much more likely using get type hints. Uh, for this, and I can do say hello. Yeah, so that's all. I think that that's all I need for that. Yeah, it's the same information, but when you get into much more uh, comp when you when you have complex code and you have complex type requirements, this will do. Uh, get type hints will do a lot more heavy lifting for you, <laughs> as evidenced by the uh, the doc string there. <laughs> all right. And we have some messages in chat. Oh, yes, thank you, if repeat. Thank, yeah, that would have fixed it. <laughs> All right. So now it's time to look at our first library, which is MyPy. MyPy, it was actually is created by or it was started by Guido himself, the creator of Python, for type checking. And that's really all it does. I say that as that's all it does, but that's that can be very powerful. Uh, there's actually not a whole lot I can I can share because this is very developer centric documentation. It's not it's not like the other two will show with Typer and Fast API. But when you install MyPy, it's just it's a pip install, and then you just run MyPy and your program. It doesn't actually run your program. All it's doing is looking at those annotations throughout all of your code and seeing what, what matches up and what doesn't. So let's, uh, let's use our say hello function here again. If we give this a string, Uh, I'm just, let's call this greeting just to make this just a little prettier. This should run a okay. Yep, hello. Uh, I already have MyPy installed here, but again, it's just a pip install. If we run MyPy against our file, 
no issues found in one source file. So our typing seems to be working just fine. However, if we, if we give it a one like we did earlier, you saw that it, uh, it runs without issue, even though technically it doesn't match our typing. If we run MyPy against this again, well, you can see that there's an inherent, uh, inherent issues with here. Again, it's not actually running our code. This would be a runtime exception, and MyPy doesn't, look, uh, doesn't handle runtime exceptions. However, if, if instead we have uh, if we change this to say value, say return none. And so instead of giving it a one here, which is a runtime exception, if we pass value of known type int into say hello, which expects, expects name of known type string, it should give us an error. So this is, this is an example of static type checking. Again, that means it's not running your code. All it is doing is this meta analysis of the various type annotations that are available in your code base. So is that type annotations only and it's not like if you add doc strings and stuff, it's not looking at those? Yeah. Uh, I believe it actually does look at the doc string typing. Uh, there, there are three different varieties of how you can specify types in Python. Uh, the one that Devin is talking about is you can you can put things like uh, type name. I'm a little fuzzy on the syntax, but uh, this is roughly the kind of thing that you're looking at, or is, maybe not at type, maybe it's at param or at var. Uh, but this is one way that you could look for this in previous versions of Python. This actually goes back to Python 2. Uh, when Python 3 was announced, uh, when Python 3 was released, the way that you would do uh, typing looked more like this, uh, which is real, which is very similar to the syntax that ended up being included when they were when they eventually got around to Python 3.5. Uh, and I believe MyPy uh, looks at any of these three. The, the modern way of doing it is is through type annotations. But I uh, I know that it looks at these two and my I know that MyPy works with Python 2, so it must be looking for this as well. And a lot of older code bases you may see uh, you'll likely see this. Yeah, that's that's why I asked is because I work in a legacy code base where we're not going to get rid of the doc strings anytime soon. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I would be shocked if there wasn't a library out there that generates type strings from doc strings, because that's going to be a super common problem. Yeah. And it honestly, if my pie doesn't handle it, every major company, <laughs> I, uh, I know Google, Facebook, and Amazon, I believe, uh, they all have their own type checking libraries for Python. <laughs> if my Pi doesn't do everything for you, there are plenty of other examples from the big tech companies that will do it. Uh, and if you're just getting into typing, uh, Instagram, you know, Facebook via Instagram developed a library called monkey type that uses your runtime to assign type annotations to your code base, uh, just as a way to get up and running with it. And then you can go in and fine tune it as you need. So the, honestly, for a, such a small code base, there's kind of not that much more I can say about MyPy. There's a lot of advanced usage. Uh, the, the only thing that I will say about MyPy is it's, uh, it's static type checking. And you saw that earlier, we had a runtime exception when I passed one into here. If, if I say that value is of type int and I use this for say hello, but I have removed this type annotation here, because it's just doing static type checking, it should give us green because it doesn't, if it doesn't know what type name is supposed to be, what this, this parameter is supposed to be, it's not going to give you an error. 
this is one of the nice things about MyPy because you can start dipping your code, you know, your toes of your code base into type checking function by function. And then eventually over time, you can bring your entire code base uh, up to bear with typings, but it will only give you errors if it spots them. Uh, so if you're, if you're working on migrating an old code base, then uh, absolutely, MyPy will play well with you and uh, not hit you over the head with a hammer <laughs> right out the gate. Uh, and it does work with any third-party libraries you, you use. A lot of modern third-party libraries have typing, uh, whether it's modern typing or the, the doc string based uh, typing, and it will use those as well. So you can actually check if your code base is using the, the types that your third-party dependencies are expecting. That's another great use for MyPy. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so we have a question from, uh, is get type hints only found in 3.9? I actually don't know when, uh, when that was included. It may be as far back as the original annotations library. Uh, let's see, Python get type hints. If I let's just say if I go back to Python 3.8, so it's uh, it's not it's at least older than 3.9. Uh, the 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 major difference with 3.9 is uh, that example that I had before, where uh, if you have if you have a dictionary or a list, let, let's say a, a dictionary, if you have a string. Uh, if all of your, uh, for a dictionary, if your keys are all strings and the values are all ints, that, that would be the type here. Uh, before 3.9, you had to import this special, uh, this uh, special uppercase D dict from the typing module. And you see a quick, quick fix, add import dict to our typing import. And that's all that was. So, uh, that's a quick intro to MyPy and type checking. Uh, that's great for QA, it's great for testing, but we're not really leveraging type annotations yet for features. And that's one of, uh, that's something that our next, the, the other two libraries we're going to look at, uh, that's where they really shine and type annotations in particular really shine. So I'm going to create a new file here. And we're going to call this CLI.py because the next uh, the next thing we're going to look at is a library called Typer, and both uh, both Typer and Fast API, which is going to be the other one we're going to look at. These are actually both by the same developer or group, so there are going to be some similarities here. But they uh, they they really know how to use type annotations and leverage the other third party libraries to make it really easy on the developer. So if you were creating a uh, command line interface, uh, there, are, there are older examples like click. I know in the past I've used the begins library, but it's not really maintained anymore. So uh, typer is, an, is another great CLI tool that uses type annotations. And, and uh, the, the, these two libraries are going to be dependent on mo uh, modern versions of Python. So. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry if you're in legacy land, but uh, it's nicer over here. <laughs> oh, our code is just out of date, but we're actually using, I think, Python 3.8 point something, so. <laughs> Very nice. Hey, that means you can put a modern front end on, on old code. <laughs> but yes, the uh, at least with Typer, minimum, Python version is going to be 3.6. I believe the minimum version for fast API is going to be 3.7. Uh, so we are looking at within the last three to four years. So uh, Typer allows you to make some wonderful and intuitive CLIs. Uh, command line interface, if you are not familiar with, we've already seen it, <laughs> MyPy. You, uh, basics for a CLI is you get this lovely documentation with all the different inputs and outputs that you could possibly want from it. And usually this is quite a hassle to build. 
and maintain more importantly. Now, uh, using, using Typer, we can leverage Python annotations and doc strings in order to make this easy for us. So the first thing we need to do is we need to import Typer. And we're just going to create a uh, def main like we did before. And it's just, uh, we're going to, uh, so we can, uh, we can print, however, you'll, if you look in the documentation, uh, they actually do, is it typer.echo? Say hello world. And if we have if we have a bit of time, uh, I can show off one reason why you may want to do this instead of print if you're building a CLI with Typer. So just like we had before, we have if name equals main, which again allows you to call anything you you have in here. Uh, you, well, it allows you to import without running our main function. Uh, and this is Typer dot run main. So already we should just be able to do uh, Python CLI and go. So there's hello world. But if we do our help, we already have help documentation with this. It's not really descriptive yet. It just says, hey, you can call us using CLI and there are options, and it gives you it gives you two things uh, by default. And if you are if you are a uh, a command line wizard, it supports install completion. So if you if you really like tab completion with uh, with your command line scripting, uh, you can uh, Typer gives you this automatically. You can also specify exactly which type of shell you want to use. If you don't give it, I believe it makes its best guess, um, as well as uh, show completion. So you get these really nice handy features out of the gate if you are a power user. But uh, to make this, uh, to power this up one level, uh, let's, uh, we're, we'll first give it a doc string. So let's say, uh, say hello to the user. If we do our help again, we uh, you can see we now have the start of a doc string in here. We can take a name just like we did before. Use our f string there. We go back to our help. We now have a positional argument called name, which is required. So if we just run this again. You see it's missing an argument name. We can give it Michael, hello, Michael. We now have an argument, a, a positional argument based CLI with 11, 11 lines of code in very nicely, uh, in a very nicely formatted verbose file. <laughs> uh, just like we saw before, uh, we can also give the, uh, anything that we can do with basic types and, and function annotations, type, uh, typer should be able to support. So I'm not, I'm not going to do repeat. Uh, let's just say, uh, do, we, do we want it to be a little extra? Oh, and should give this a type there as well. That is kind of the point of the talk, isn't it? Uh, and let's make this a little fancy. Let's say greeting equals hello. Uh, if if extra, oh, so we have this. The I I, I do kind of like these inline if else bits if they make sense. And yeah, so we just have hello. And now instead of our f string down here, we'll do greeting dot format name. We run this again. 
uh, it's just hello. We, but we can also give it an extra flag. If you are, uh, if you are familiar with command lines, uh, Boolean values are just expressed by a default value uh, and by just adding the flag in here. So dash dash extra, it matches the parameter name. So now we have hello. And if we go back and update, uh, or not update, but view our, our help string, you'll see that uh, here extra and no extra with the default value of false was added to our uh, command line options. The other thing that, uh, now, the, uh, we're just seeing what we've used before. We have strings, we have some Boolean values. Uh, we could add in some optional, uh, you know, uh, some optional types into here. But what these, what this fast API and what a lot of these other type aware libraries re uh, where they really shine is instead of taking in strings, let's say that we take, we set this to an int. And, or actually, let's, let's keep this, let's keep this a string. Let's add another thing here. And we're just gonna call this times and it is an int with a default value of one. So let's say we have our greeting here and we can do uh, for blank in range times. If you're not familiar with uh, Python too much. Uh, this just means that we're uh, underscore is the universal Python la language for we're not going to use this variable. And this for blank and range uh, means we're going to do this loop however, however many number of times. Oh, and that's, like, yeah, let's look at the help again. So we have another optional uh, flag down here times and you'll see that it is an integer type which is different than our uh, different than the handling of our boolean with a default value of 1 if we call michael again here uh, the default value is it prints out one time but we can give it times 4 it prints out four times uh, what typer is leveraging here is the fact, uh, because it knows that this is an int, all of the information that typer receives when we, when we pass it this information, four is a string, but it knows that it's expecting an int value. So it converts it automatically to an int for us. However, if we give time something that is not an integer value, like say hi, we're gonna get a high is not a valid integer. It's doing error handling for us before we ever get into our actual uh, function. So uh, this is already better than, than or uh, it, this is similar to the types of functionality that other CLI libraries have like click, uh, but it's leveraging pure Python code in here. We don't have, to, uh, if we were using click, we'd have to do something like uh, like param and we'd have to say uh, it's times and it's an int type and, and all and, and all this other stuff. But with here, it knows that it's an int type. And, and really to, to get uh, hit the, you know, to get this home, uh, if we import CLI, we can do uh, we can run CLI.main. We add that into there, boom. It, in addition to it being a CLI, it's now it, this this CLI function is now importable into your Python runtime code wherever else you want to use it. So this was particularly useful if you have an internal utility function in your code base that you want to then make available as a standalone uh, command line utility, because you can use it in both places and you don't have to write any additional code. There, there's a lot more that you can do with with typer, uh, just as uh, just as in, uh, some examples that they list in here. They have a lot of thing, a lot of additional handling you can do with command line arguments. You can give your command line arguments docs uh, their own descriptive doc strings. So rather uh, rather than here just saying 
uh, name is required, you can then give it a description to put behind there. Uh, there, you can also do things like having multiple commands. So we were just having, uh, we had a single entry point into our main function here. But if we want to do something, uh, uh, let's say app equals typer dot, uh, I think it's just typer dot typer. And then we can do app dot command. And then down here, instead of typer.run, we do, it's just, uh, oh, we just run our app, I believe. Uh, and that allows us to add more commands in here. So we can do command, uh, let's say helper, and I just, I'm just gonna give it nothing and nothing. Oh, and for being good MyPy compatible, we can add none up there, I'm just gonna say, So if we run this again, and get out of there. If we if we run our CLI again with our help doc, you'll notice that now. Yeah, here we go. Commands. Uh, we now have multiple commands that we can do. If we want to run our hello from before, uh, we need to add the name of the function here, which is main. And it, oh yeah, <laughs> we get our type checking from before. Yep, it runs it as normal. Or we can call the other function helper. And now, uh, now we have a command line utility with multiple different commands available to it. So uh, that's, if you're making a command line utility, this is a super easy way to do it where all of your, co your code remains fully compatible with the rest of your code base. It's really easy. Uh, and uh, let's say uh, if you have this main function elsewhere, uh, this function annotation stuff, which is this, this ampersand prefix, you can also just uh, down here, uh, that ampersand is shorthand for doing something like uh, app.command uh main so if you have a function elsewhere in your code base and you just want to add it to your command line utility this is what you would do all right uh, any more questions on cli before we move on to fast api Uh, is it good? Is it good to put stuff into my uh, uh, C, uh, I see CI? I just see that as continuous integration. Yeah, uh, yeah. Something like MyPy is uh, that is something that you would put into your CI/CD pipeline, absolutely. Uh, along with anything else you want to do, like uh, type formatters. Uh, I, I like black because it's opinionated, <laughs> uh, things like that. But absolutely, uh, it would just be part of your CI/CD pipeline. Uh, and I know that it plays nicely with uh, GitHub, GitLab, and any of the other uh, uh, code repositories. Absolutely. All right. So for uh, to, to really show off just how much you can leverage these type annotations and type hints. Let me introduce the last library we're going to look at, which is FastAPI. FastAPI it, it allows you to build a rest, uh, RESTful APIs in Python that leverage your Python annotations. If, you are, if you've ever used Flask before, the syntax is going to look very familiar, but the under, uh, the underlying layers are quite different, uh, which is pretty great, and, uh, actually. So if you want uh, if you want to move to fast API uh, from I would say pretty much anything other than Django, it's going to be easy <laughs> just just because Django is so uh, batteries included. Although Django three they now support async uh, and uh, ASCII, which is a very nice step forward for them, but. Fast API. 
uh, let's, uh, uh, this is their documentation, just like it's the same people as Typer. And you can see all of the, uh, the accolades and we'll see very soon why it is, uh, why, why you should be aware of it and maybe choose it for your next web API project. If we jump into here, I'm gonna create uh, app.py, which is pretty common for these uh, web APIs. So we're gonna do from fast API, import fast API. We initialize our app. And again, if you are familiar with the Flask style syntax, you do app.route, uh, it takes a string and let's, we're just gonna have this be the home. We create a function, doesn't take anything. That's pretty great. We're going to return, uh, we can have it either return a string or uh, more likely what you're gonna do if you're building out a REST API, uh, you, you can return a dictionary uh, let's just call this message and uh, hello, just to be pretty simple. Now you notice unlike the, uh, you can do something like uh, they have, uh, was it debug? Yeah, so you, you can do something like that. Flask has this, uh, you can do app.run in your if name equals main. It's not, you definitely do not want to do it in production uh, and the way that you should instead be running these is using uh, the whiskey or ASCII uh, server to do it directly. So their recommendation is a library called Uvicorn. There are other, there are other uh, ASCII libraries available like Hypercorn, uh, but for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna use Uvicorn. We just need to give it the file name and the name of the of our fast API app. And I'm actually going to give uh, call this with reload. And what that will do is every time that this file changes and is saved, it will reload our our web server. So we can just we, we don't have to stop it and restart it every time we make a change. So now if we go to yeah, localhost 8000. 8, oh, what did I get wrong? Home take zero position, ah, uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's go to the, uh, the documentation. I'm, my brain must have blinked on, on an empty home initialization. Oh, it's not that route. That's what. <laughs> yeah, so it's very it, it's very flask, except it's not get. <laughs> Oops. Now we should it should have also reloaded already. Rerun. There we go. Uh, message hello. So we uh, we can return strings. So if you're doing some, if you're not making a REST API endpoint, if you're returning a web page, you can use templating. Uh, if you want those, uh, you can return the templates. You can return strings, uh, and it will just uh, you can return a string that is your the contents of your HTML file, and you've now rendered an HTML page. But you can also give it this dictionary or a list or any other JSON compatible uh, value, and it will know how to handle it. So we're not really doing anything special yet. Uh, what is interesting with Fast API is when we get into uh, the adding parameters and all the type checking. So the first thing we may want to do is uh, we we're going to look at some cookies because I'm hungry. Uh, so we have our, we have a cookie endpoint and let's say that we, we want, uh, uh, we're gonna give it a, a cookie ID. So 
this would be a path parameter. If we wanted to, uh, if we want to use this, we need to make sure that the variable name matches. And for for the sake of well, yeah. So uh, let's say our CID is an integer. Uh, if we're if we're using Mongo or something else for an object ID, uh, we you can set this to a string. But if we if we set this to an int, just like we saw with typer, it will automatically convert it for us and do any kind of type checking before it gets to our function. Uh, we can then say, uh, we'll just echo back our, our CID here. And uh, let's also just add the, the type and we'll just call type on CID. Have the server reload. Come back over here. Our home is not found, so we can do. Uh, was it cookies? Yeah, cookies, cookie, uh, and then we'll just give it an ID of one, two, three, and see why I didn't like it. <laughs> um. get I wonder so I was hoping to show this just a second ago but I wonder if that's actually what's nope what was the error yeah I need to throw it on here wrapper descriptor object is not iterable vars argument Interesting. I am not actually sure because this this should match up to their path uh, to something like their path parameters in here. I kind of wonder if, if this is something that is going on with a bug in a current version. Let's see. So this is this will reload and items. Their example is items and give it a one. OK. It may not like cookies necessarily. Oh, no, I'm not actually sure. I don't think that should, yeah, like that shouldn't do anything there. Uh, so I noticed they're not, uh, so their example didn't actually include the type on there. So if we go back, it's still giving an internal server error. I wonder if it has something to do with your second dictionary key with the type uh, casting there. Maybe. Uh, it looks like it. Well, let's actually just return the CID here. Cookie CID async def. Okay, cookie one. Curious if we, yeah, if we add that back in, are we also going to get? Another server error. Yep, that appears to be it. So yeah, uh, we're not going to call that. Uh, oh well, that's as we were. I so, mean, you might be able to do something where you run that type uh, part uh, in the line above it, and then just return, store that as a variable, and then return it because maybe it's a just complaining like, hey, I, I don't want to do anything in this return. I'm just expecting basically a, a string and that's not what I'm getting or just expecting JSON on dictionary. It could be, although uh, this return would not evaluate until that type had evaluated because of the Python order of operations. But uh, it could just, it could also be that it just didn't like having a very, uh, a key in here called type. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll just say T and And then if it works, so uh, we'll never we'll never know what it was because we changed two things at once. Yep. 
we are we're bad scientists. It's hey, it's still there. I got no, no other ideas then. <laughs> well, hey, we're we're rolling. We're, we will steamroll ahead. We have we have a cookie. We do in fact have a cookie. Now just uh, now now that we're back, uh, so we have int uh, type int here for for our ID val uh, valuation oh, and the zoom bar is in my way. So just like we saw before, if we try doing high, you'll see that we get this validation error uh, that fast API is doing on our behalf. Uh, I believe uh, with, you should also be able to give uh, custom messages in here as well if you if you so choose. Yeah, uh, value is not a, a type integer. And you can do this however many number of times you want. Uh, if we if we have another parameter here, we can add is we can add another thing over here. The only thing with these path parameters is that they must be in the same order that they are listed in your in your route. But it is doing type checking there. Now, if we if in, if we don't have any more path parameters and we have more parameters here. Uh, let's just keep name here. Uh, we can supply, we should be able to supply name and that now becomes a query parameter. So if we go back to one uh, cookies, oh yeah. So uh, loc query. So is uh, in this case, because we didn't give name a default value, we would have to include Uh, name as a query parameter in order for it to go through. And just to show that the value is, is passing through, I'll put name in here. Reload. So we're passing our query parameter of name uh, into here. But if we, if we want to give this a default value, uh, we can do that as well. We can go back here, not give it a name. We still get a name. Or just like, uh, or we can make this an option, a completely optional value. And again, the way that we do that is from typing import optional. The default value goes to none, and our type isn't string, it's an optional string. Call this data equals our CID. Uh, if name is not none, then we'll add our name value into our output. And we'll return our data. And we can come back here. Uh, it should run without issue. If we give it the name, it should give us our name. Pretty simple. And uh, just like before, it will do any type of, uh, of casting, type casting that it needs to. If we give it a Boolean value, uh, I, I believe with Boolean values, you can, e you can just do this uh, dot name. If you just give it name, it interprets that as true. And if you don't give it, it interprets it as either false or the default value. Or you could do, uh, if it's a Boolean, you could also do just name equals false or zero. Anything that evaluates to false false ness or truth ness in Python. Now, this is this is pretty simple, uh, just like the other examples that we've seen. But if we want to do something a little more complex, like let's say we want to take a, uh, a request body. We're taking in a JSON document or XML or anything else we want, as long as it converts. Uh, Fast API is, uh, is built 
Uh, one of the libraries that he uses for, for type validation is called Pydantic. You can think of it as something similar to adders or data classes. But for, for uh, Pydantic, uh, it's actually, it, it, think of it like uh, the Django ORM or SQL Alchemy when you create a model that represents your database, but you're only using it for data validation. So we can do from Pydantic, which gets installed when you install FastAPI. And we're going to import their base model. We're going to create a class and we're going to create a full-blown cookie class here. And it inherits from our Pydantic based model. Now, just like we saw before with data classes, it's going, uh, it uses the same style of syntax we saw with our variable annotations. So uh, we have our, our cookie ID, let's say the name, uh, we have a name there and uh, is it a favorite? So we can give it a Boolean with the default value of false. If we, if we want to use this cookie to, as the prototype and, and to validate an incoming payload to our API, uh, there's two, there are two things we need to do. Uh, the first thing we need to do is this is no longer going to be, uh, well, Let's keep this up. Uh, this is, we're going to have a new route here that is a post because we're going to be sending this data. And we're going to do, let's say, cookies. Dot... Oh, and actually, one other thing I should note is we actually will need this to come up here if we want to do this cookies.new. Because when you are uh, with Fast API, if you have, if you want to do this cookies.new, but then also cookies dot anything else, order matters. It's going to it's going to check if the incoming route is this one before this one. So if you have new underneath this one down here, it will never actually reach new. It will always just say, oh, new does not evaluate to an integer. So that is that's a gotcha if you are looking to. Uh, do these kind of intuitive RESTful style endpoints. So we have a, a new cookie. And the cookie is of type cookie. And we're just going to return the cookie as it was sent to us. Crazy. And just to, just to see if this works, we're going to come back here, but I'm going to open up a REST API client here. And we're going to create, oh, that's not important. Oh, I am blanking. Oh, I know why. It's <laughs> it was hidden under the zoom bar yet again. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. So we have a new request. Cookie. We're gonna make a post request to our local host on eight thousand. We're going to, oh, and it's going to be, the endpoint is cookies.new, and we're going to give it a JSON where the, we give uh, the CID, let's say is one, two, three, name, uh, chocolate, and favorite is true. Oh, hey, there we go. So back, 
Let's see what this error is this time around. Model field object is not iterable. Should, should you be returning the class or the, uh, the variable? You saw, that is exactly right. I, I was wondering why this didn't look correct earlier. You're absolutely correct. We need, his, we, for the sake of just returning the thing itself, we need to return the actual instance of the object, not the class. Let's send that again. And so, yes, so this cookie object matches the class, uh, the, the model that we created over here with CID as an int, name string, and a favorite Boolean. And we're just returning the same thing back as is. We can make whatever changes we needed to it. We could, you know, we could just return success equals true or a 204 uh, return code or whatever else we wanted to. But uh, this is just it passing in the information. If we, if we wanted to use this, uh, this cookie object, we get we have access to uh, the to any of the values that we created just like we saw before with our data class, and we can also you know, we can also write methods on here. So let's say you know, if we have a cook class, uh, let's just say uh, self dot cooked equals true. And cooked is a boolean, and it also is set to false. So if we wanted, if we wanted to uh, do a cookie dot uh, cook, and then we return the cookie. <laughs> if we run, if we run this again, cooked equals true. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so the, uh, that is it. Just uh, doing the validation on it. If we can, uh, if the CID was a string instead. Uh, it's doing that type conversion for us. So one, two, three was successfully converted to an integer on our behalf. But if it pi cannot be converted to an integer, we'll get this uh, 422 unprocessable entity. And this is the same, uh, same type of warning, although better formatted than we saw in the browser for uh, our uh, query parameters and our URL routing, except now we're doing it with a full body. Uh, request body. Is that a common status code for validation errors? I've never seen that before. Uh, I guess it depends. On, uh, well, I don't know how common it is. Uh, the The developer of Fast API decided that if Pydantic doesn't uh, isn't able to process the incoming request body, it would be a four twenty two. If you wanted. Uh, you could, it, it, if you were doing something like this on your own, maybe you just make it a 400 error. But you know, HTTP codes, the more specific you can get, the, the better handled they can be. And honestly, it's completely arbitrary uh, as to what error code the, the maintainer of the API so chooses to raise for any given situation. All right, cool, thanks. Okay. Now uh, I'm going to add. Uh, I'm going to add three more, or well, one more thing in here. Really, uh, we're going to add some doc strings, because everyone loves a good doc string. Uh, let's say uh, cookie model, or uh, let's say rep represents a cookie, and for our our new cookie. Uh, we're going to have bakes a new cookie. And our cookies is get a cookie. So this, this syntax here, when you're writing your API, it's pretty concise given the, uh, given the features that we're seeing so far where it's leveraging type annotations. However, there's one other really big reason you may want to choose FastAPI because of how it leverages these type annotations. 
And that is because if we go to, uh, instead of going to our index, if we go to docs, it uses the open API spec to automatically build our API documentation for us using our type uh, all of our type annotations. So that you, uh, you see, we have uh, the request body is required. Uh, it is expecting annotation JSON. Uh, and there are multiple ways that you can specify what you want to take in. But using our cookie schema, it has already generated an example value. Uh, you can then supply uh, all, uh, all of the different possible uh, success and error codes, but you see that it already gives us 200 successful. Uh, we can supply an example, but you, it also automatically gives us this 422 validation error in here. Same thing if we go into our cookies, we can see that the doc string is, is here that we provided for our function definition. And uh, we can all, we can try it out. So uh, uh, th this is just one of the uh, many examples of these uh, interactive documentation websites. So and this is all it automatically updates every single time that we talk uh, that we we build our build and run our code base because there's there's no way that this auto documentation will ever differ from what is act is currently running on your server, which is a fantastic optimization. So uh, other than going through, uh, uh, continue, well, I can continue to answer any more questions that people have. Uh, fast, okay, so, yeah, the docs feature is really neat. Fast API is ready for production. Uh, I believe uh, as long as your IT department doesn't need every piece of software they use to be version uh, arbitrarily version 1.0 or higher, because I think if I do pip list here, fast API is still 0. Point something. Fast API is 0, 0.63. This has more point updates than a lot of other 1.0 libraries are likely going to have. I it is production ready. Uh, it it is actually built. Uh, Fast API is built on an ASCII service uh, uh, web framework called Starlet, which has been around for even longer. Uh, and uh, I, I absolutely, I would have. Uh, I know businesses are using Fast API in production. Uh, a lot of data science shops really, uh, Python-based data science shops really like uh, Fast API because of the auto documentation. But if you're already doing all of your machine learning and data science in Python already, it's really easy to just provide a front, uh, a web front end with Fast API around all of your existing models already. Absolutely. Uh, oh, and the the other the other big thing, uh, it if this may have just kind of flown over people, but uh, you notice that we also have this async keyword. St the underlying web framework Starlet is an async compatible library. So if we have an if we have an async function, so we have a let's say async. Uh, uh, async, uh, let's just say it's a, a long, we're going to simulate a long task. Oh, async def. And let's just say this return, uh, this returns a Boolean. Uh, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to be from async IO import sleep. Yes. So this is just going, uh, we're going to do, use async and await to sleep for five seconds and then we'll return true. So th this would be, if you have an async library that goes out and does database operations or fetches from another web API or does, does any, any of these other asynchronous operations, uh, you can either supply a, a regular function or you can give it this async 
function, or also known as a coroutine. And let us uh, let's say let's actually say up here. So let's say that it takes a little while to actually cook something. So this cookie dot cook. Uh, if I wanted to do this just a little bit differently, I could actually just move this up here. So let's say we're actually waiting for this cookie to cook because I love a good actual build out example. We'll make this an async class method instead of here. So we have our async. We will await for our cookie to cook at which point we will then return the cooked cookie back to the user. Uh, I need to restart my web server using Uvicorn. If we go back over here to our new cookie, this should, uh, and, we <laughs> and we give it a valid value. Let's just use, put this back to a string. So uh, chocolate cookie, send one, two, three, four, five, and it returns a cooked cookie. So that, that is another big advantage that uh, Fast API has. If you, if you are leveraging async technologies, it's really easy to leverage async technologies. All right, back. Uh, if you return the whole model from the API, does Fast API just return the fields or does it return the functions as well? So uh, we just answered this. In our, in our cookie model up here, the only thing that uh, when, when under the hood, Pydantic or and data classes and any other library that does this style of syntax, the, the things that we express up here with the types are the only things that are going to be used in the initializers and any conversion to a dictionary. I believe, uh, well, we should be able to do, is it cookie dot, yeah, dot dict, and that's method. So re return cookie, uh, uh, fast API is, uh, before it actually generates the response to our call. It's called, uh, if it sees that it's a pydantic model, it will call uh, this cookie.dict to turn it into a dictionary, at which point pydantic only returns whatever is up here, not any of the methods, not, not anything else uh, on the object itself. Uh, can you do a streaming endpoint on Fast API? I have not. Uh, I have not had a reason to, but that's a pretty quick Google search. I've done. I've done streaming with other async libraries like uh, Socket Connections. Uh, let's say Fast API. Uh, so, yeah, Socket IO or Sockets. So it looks like uh, maybe out of the box it might not, but there is a there's an existing plugin that gives you uh, socket functionality into fast API. Yep, socket manager, so app.socket.io on join, and here's your handle with your emitters and everything else, so uh, absolutely. Uh, because this is modeled after, after Flask, it is still considered a micro framework. So unlike Django, where everything is batteries included, uh, like Flask and Tornado and uh, you, you just selectively add in the components that you need in order to build out your app. And so, yeah, if you want to do uh, sockets, uh, web sockets, you can just you, you add another uh, pip install. If you had a calcul, ooh, yes. If, okay, so if you had a calculated field, could you use an annotation to return that with model response? I don't think so. Uh, there is a way that uh, we could we could get around that. Uh, there may be there may be a way that it's built in, but let, let me show you. I think why not. So uh, this computed property uh, that that they are talking about. If we want to have uh, uh, let's uh, compute a property given an ID and the name. Uh, 
let's say we wanted to, let's just say we, we built up an, an object ID uh, that, ret that returns a string. Uh, so we need self in here to access that stuff. This is, this is where Python, uh, this property wrapper is how you do computed properties in Python. And so if we want to do an object ID in the style, uh, uh, that's a string, we could just return, uh, we'll do an F string with the CID and let's just put a slash in there and the name, just kind of being lazy. If, well, we'll use this in just a second, but to just print out what this gives us, let's do uh, cookie dot uh, object ID. If we run, not that, if we, come on. If we run this again, well, we'll wait five seconds, but in our output down here, Oh, we get a name error. You gotta do self dot on each See, of those, right? You are absolutely correct. I forgot to do self dot and it warned me in here. Oops. Yeah, because we're accessing something on the existing object. Uh, for the time being, I'm actually going to comment out our await so we can do this a little faster. Okay, so here's our, op our computed property object ID of one, two, three in chocolate, but you'll notice it didn't get added over here. If uh, there may be something under the hood that we can mark this as please add this in, but we actually, uh, I believe we can do something like, uh, let's say our output, we're gonna do uh, cookie dot, we're gonna call that dict. Now output, if we hover over this, dict string any. Uh, so this, this dictionary, you can see it's actually returning this custom type here, which they're using as some shorthand uh, internally, which means this could be a dict or a string or any, I guess. Or actually, no, this is a dictionary where all of the keys are strings and all of the, value, the values could be any type. I'm pretty sure that's how they want you to read that, which means this is a dictionary. So if we wanted to add this object ID to our output, we could manually just add it in with uh, cookie, uh, cookie dot, object ID. And then instead of returning cookie, we return output. If we call this again, object ID has been added in to here. And if uh, honestly, if we want to do, if we want to make this even better in this cookie class, I would just go in here and create um, uh, with with properties, self, it returns a dict and just uh, this, let's actually use this any syntax from up here. So uh, in addition to optional, we would import any and we'll just copy, uh, we'll copy our code in here. So instead of cookie, we would be referencing self Then we return the output here. Then down in our code here, we return our cookie dot with properties as a way that we can reuse this, uh, py uh, uh, this pydantic model plus any computer properties that we wanted to add in with this function. So if we call this again, it should give us the same thing, except now we can, we can go ahead and reuse that wherever we want. So great question. All right, I don't see any more questions. I have uh, people, people going, we, we definitely are over time, but uh, I hope this was a great introduction or uh, to Python type annotations and, and typing and, uh, or learn, learn something new. Ooh, someone posted an issue in here. There's a bug report ignores... to fast API talking okay. about this specific issue. <laughs> 14 days ago, so this is And they is, passed the book fresh. to Bidantic saying it's their fault. Absolutely. So yes, this is, this, this is on Fast API, but it, it would be up to Pydantic 
to add this kind of functionality into there optionally because that that's it's on the Pydantic library. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so that is the end of the talk. Thank you so much. This was really good. Yeah, uh, a deep dive into a very narrow and <laughs> a very narrow topic. <laughs>